1985, Tanzania was crippled by food shortages, high inflation and literally no business activity. Twenty years later, the scene is a lot different. Economic growth is buoyant, averaging 7% since the turn of the millennium, but getting to this point wasn't easy. When Julius Nyerere led the country to independence in 1961, he put forth his vision of Ujamaa socialism, a model of communalist society based on freedom, self-reliance and familyhood. While this was successful in politically unifying the country and making Swahili the national language, Nyerere's political dream became an economic nightmare. Then, in 1986, the country was forced to liberalize its economy. But these reforms would only start bearing fruit a decade later. When we took the socialist path, there was not a single individual who was allowed to do business. But as soon as we opened up the market, you find that we have uh, quite a sizable number of uh, Tanzanian entrepreneurs, as well as foreigners, who have come here to do business. At the time, Deputy UN Secretary General Asharoz Magiro was part of Tanzania's government and helped implement the country's recovery plan. Like others, she says Tanzania's transformation has been remarkable. I should say 10, 15 years back, uh, Tanzania was still part of what uh, is known as command economy. But change your card, uh, the country opened up and that was almost inevitable with globalization. But the country has been able to revise its uh, land laws, which is important because that is the main asset that the country has. But sound policies have proved no match for a global financial crisis that's catapulted the world into the worst economic slowdown since the 1930s. Of course, we have, we have, we have, we have uh, macroeconomic stability, but um, we are seeing the crisis as, um, as, as a major threat. To the, to, the, to the stability, that, 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 that the gains that we have made. For example, when we had the, the high oil prices, it, it, it adversely affected the stability on, 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 on inflation. So now we are now quite, quite busy now trying to, to, contain, to contain inflation. Contain inflation. So if, 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 the, if, this now f if the economic recession has to, to, to continue for, for, for much longer, we are going to see growth, growth being affected, well, we may, also, we may also end up with shrinkage of the whole economy. And it's in the tourism sector, which contributes a quarter of the country's foreign exchange earnings, where businesses are really feeling the pinch. Uh, we have seen a tremendous decrease in number of people coming, as well as uh, a number of inquiries. Normally the period between March and May, that's when we receive a lot of inquiries, but this year has been different. Uh, I can say we have received less inquiries to the extent of being about 50%. It's definitely a trend that I would say all of us is feeling at the moment. Things are dropping. Um, obviously businesses are holding back in doing conferences being a conference resort and also a leisure resort. Um, the trend at the moment is that people are not booking. Over the past few years, Tanzania has capitalized on its rarest commodity, tanzanite, a gorgeous blue stone only found in the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. Now, as consumers around the world are under pressure, demand for this precious stone has dropped significantly. While that slowdown is, is persisting, but also there's been downward pressure on the prices. So we, as a company, suffer from both. And it's in getting through this tough time where Tanzania's long-standing relationship with China is giving the country a vital leg up. Tanzania is our good old friend. And we have established foreign diplomatic relations for, fa for, fast for the past 45 years. So we, you, we, by using today's words, we call our the all weather a friend. So uh, the relationship was established by the uh, Chairman Mao and Premier Ju and Malin Mu Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. It is a question of of um, of improving. The, the, the conditions for doing business. We've been trying. We've not really got there. 
So, for example, rec recently what we have done is to, to ask the, the business community, our, our friends, to, to, to be honest with us. What are the things that they, they think we, we, we should do to improve the doing business climate here in Tanzania? So what would you need to do to start up shop in Tanzania? Yeah, if somebody wants to come and invest in Tanzania, we have simplified it. First of all, we have got the legislation uh, which created this institution. So that legislation spells out if an investor wants to come, he must have a legal company, he must have uh, the money to do the business, at least if they are foreigners, $300,000. Uh, then he must, have, he must prove to you that he has got a place to invest, that he has got the land. And then the, the bus he has got a business plan. So it's very simple. So once you have those documents, uh, you submit them to the Tanzania Investment Center. We process them within seven days to 14 days because, again, the legislation gives us period in which we have to tell an investor yes or no. So within 14 days maximum, uh, we must be able to come back to the investor and tell that investor, yes, your project is in process and so on. Back in the early days of independence, Nyeres Ujama socialism promoted communal farming villages, which were set up to ensure food security. And last year, government realized just how important the sector is, as the country faced massive food and fuel price shocks. And that's where the economic processing zones come in. Tanzania produces a lot of agricultural products. And the most of these agricultural products are being exported in their raw forms. Now we want to reverse that. We want to ensure that almost all the agricultural products which are produced from within are being added value from within and then exported. We offer a lucrative package of incentives for investors who come to invest in Tanzania. Now for the export processors, export processing zones, first of all we offer a tax holiday of 10 years. That's uh, no corporation tax for 10 years. And then investors are exempted from payment of withholding tax on rent, on dividends, on interest for another 10 years. We, they are, uh, these are the... The capital goods, capital goods and the raw materials can come in tax-free, duty-free. Food is still relatively expensive, although inflation is now under control. But still, with the majority of Tanzanians living below the poverty line, it's in agriculture where China's influence will play a major developmental role. The Tanzania side would like to have the joint venture bank, agriculture, agriculture bank. They put the agriculture sector uh, in the utmost position. Uh, you see that the food is most important, it's, uh, it's life. Also, Tanzania is very rich in the potential land, edible land, in the irrigation. And uh, they, they are very active to cooperate, with China, to cooperate with China side, Chinese side, to establish the joint actual agriculture bank to give the access, access to the farmers to have the loan. Part of the strategy to attract foreign investment was to rid the country of corruption. President Kikwete put the record straight when he fired governor of the central bank at the time, Daudi Balali, in a scandal involving more than 116 million US dollars, which had been improperly paid to 22 firms through the bank's external payment arrears account. Governance, especially in Africa, is a very important problem. Fighting against corruption is very important. And everywhere where something is done correctly, we have to command that the, the government was a case of, you are right in quoting it, uh, President Kutkwete, in this question of the central bank. There may be other cases like this in other uh, part of Africa. But uh, it's obvious that uh, governance, which may appear something which is uh, very far, from economic policy, it in fact at the roots of a correct implementation of the good policies. One corruption is evil. Uh, corrup corruption corruption makes makes doing business expensive. Corruption increases costs costs of 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 of, of running government government activities cost of, of for example if, if there is corruption 
construction of a road become more expensive. Of course, we've been, we've been, we've been trying. It's, it's, not, it's not so easy. So we've been trying to, we, we, we have strengthened our, 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 our anti-corruption bureau. Anti-corruption bureau. They're, they're doing a lot of invest, investigation. Now, at the beginning, people beginning we were not seeing anything. N now they're beginning to see. Because I said, the first thing we do is, le le let's build the institutional framework for, for dealing with this problem. Then we started employing new people, training, um, the new the legislation. So now 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 they began to 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 to, to be quite 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 busy. Uh, we have we have I think about five cases already. We have an, an, another one, another few of them, two or three already already lined up for 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 action. So we'll continue with this one. Just send the message home that be honest, be transparent, be responsible enough in 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 doing business. In, 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 in performing your duties as, 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 as a public servant. Starting up a business can be challenging in any country, and one of the major attractions in Tanzania has been the Land Reforms Act, which allows investors to own land, a necessity that was previously unattainable. More, more than tax incentives, that is, those are the incentives. If you can make my entry into your country as quickly as possible, you make sure that I live uh, peacefully in the country. There is no disturbance. It's a country of law and order. And if I want to access land, I can access land. Those are some of the incentives that we provide. Because in some other countries, you find that a foreigner cannot have access to land. He, it mu he must acquire it from uh, locals, or which forces you to have an intermarriage with even somebody that you don't even know. But for us, yeah, what we say, the law provides that if you're an investor, then you will access land. But if you are not an investor, as a foreigner, you cannot access land. There's been a, a long-standing need for infrastructure development in Tanzania, and that is widely recognized. I think a lot of the recent studies that have been done on aid effectiveness are particularly interesting. Recent surveys showing that health indicators have improved, education indicators have improved, and these are things that will feed into growth slowly over time. But to make an immediate impact on income levels and income growth to try to alleviate poverty in the near term. There really needs to be a focus on agriculture given that it's what most of the population is involved in. Infrastructure of course has been a key bottleneck in that regard and the government has turned its attention to addressing that bottleneck. Tanzania is Africa's third largest gold producer after South Africa and Ghana. And during these difficult economic times, gold should be a bit of a good news story, but mining the yellow metal is proving a challenge. And the biggest challenge here is the lack of adequate infrastructure. There are a lot of challenges in Tanzania, but other than security, I think our second major challenge probably is infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure in Tanzania is not that well developed. Uh, it is very challenging. I see mines operate in very remote area, and the connection between the mines and ports is you have a long track of land, so you have to either to drive or use a rail. The rail, the central rail, is um, you know almost 40 years old. It's now being uh, rehabilitated, uh, but in patches, so it's still a big problem. Cargo clearance on the port is a big problem. You have a lot of stack of containers, three, four levels, um, and, and it becomes very inefficient for for us as, as a mine. But the third problem uh, is the power situation. Uh, there's a huge shortage uh, of power supply in, in this country uh, and looking long term is likely to be more of a problem. But it's not only poor infrastructure that's posing a threat to the development of the sector. Authorities themselves are putting a spanner in the works as they plan to implement a new mining policy regime which will more than likely increase royalty rates and give fewer tax breaks to mining companies. And some say this could deter investors, particularly as the world sees metal prices tanking. But I'm more concerned about the future of the mining sector. Um, uh, as a country, are we going to choose uh, big mining companies that we can monitor, or are we going to go uh, the uh, Sierra Leonean, Congo, uh, route where uh, the, the argument will be okay, half Tanzanians uh, invest. 
if we were to take politics out of the mining sector in Tanzania, which would be very difficult at this point, we, I would have recommended that we go for big large scale mi mining companies like most of these countries have done, like in Botswana, you don't really have a drive of individual Botswanans going to do uh, mining. And simply because you cannot enforce environmental standards when you have hundreds of people, you cannot uh, ensure royalty, I mean payment of taxes, royalties as well. So the issue is individual Tanzanians or the whole lot of Tanzania. And then also because <coughs> of this politicization of the sector, People forget that the big mining companies that we have, about six of the largest mining companies here, um, they cover less than 96% of the mining activities in the country. But one area where there are huge developments in infrastructure and no slowdown in demand is the telecommunications sector. As with other African countries, telecoms development poses a conundrum for economists as to the real underlying growth of a country. It just doesn't seem to add up that the telecom sector in Tanzania is growing at around 20%, while most of the population still lives in poverty, and only 9% have access to formal banking. And that's where mobile banking comes in. As economists, we think we know a lot about African economies, but there's still great uncertainty as to the actual size of these economies. Is Tanzania, for example, as large as we think, or is there a large informal sector still not accounted for in the official statistics? The interesting thing about the telecom sector, especially mobile telecoms, is that it's a way to tap this informal economy, demand that previously perhaps hadn't been noted, didn't impact on the formal economy, didn't contribute to the tax base in any meaningful way. The advent of mobile telecoms in Africa has provided a means of tapping into that sector. And this is why I think we're starting to see these dramatic growth rates. In a sense, it's really just telling us that the economy that actually exists may be larger than we think. Commercial banks uh, 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 can and are reaching out further. Uh, that's great, and, and we're helping them to do that. I think one of the most exciting developments is going to be the role that mobile telephony can play in this, because Tanzania is both blessed and, in a sense, cursed by its size and its low pop population density. Combine that with pretty weak infrastructure, and you've got a real problem for banks to actually set up fixed branches. The numbers don't add up. In, in many, many rural areas. Standard Chartered Bank agrees. Standard Chartered Bank is, doesn't, doesn't itself compete on the number of branches because I think we've already got banks, microfinance organizations who specifically have uh, a gambit to increase the number of uh, outlets there. Uh, its strategy is really has been to look at alternative channels to bring banking services to, to its customers. We've recently launched mobile banking, so we're the first bank to launch mobile banking in the market which allows customers to transfer money, um, to look at their balances, to look at mini statements, etc., um, which I think will bring significant uh, customer convenience. Uh, we believe the mobile banking channel uh, is, is a particularly uh, critical channel going forward just because mobile penetration is, is countrywide. For Zantal, the third mobile operator in Tanzania, originally an import from the island of Zanzibar, mobile banking forms a pivotal role in the company's strategy. We were the first of the operators to launch a mobile banking service here. And we do see that as a very positive, not just for, for, for the sake of, move, it's more than money. That's, that's the way we describe it. Uh, it's more than just moving money. It's about creating an infrastructure which can facilitate trade in, in, in the broadest of senses. Um, the telephone can be a great enabler um, itself in, in helping people to, uh, who, who are in remote locations to communicate with each other and do business differently. And we've seen that happen by overlaying on top of that uh, an infrastructure which allows money to be transferred, payments to be made, uh, grants to be paid. Uh, there's a whole range of things uh, that, that become possible. Overall, Tanzania's banking sector remains liquid, but to make sure it stays that way, government has put a task force together to monitor the situation. The first area that, that, that they really concentrated on was to make, to ensure that there is stability in the banking sector, which so, which so far we were saying we have succeeded. And of course, the, the financial sector reforms that we have made, the economic reforms, have helped us a lot 
in terms of stabilizing the, the, the banking sector. But, no, but now we are, we are, we are seeing, we are seeing um, the, 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 the Im impact of the, of, of, the, of the crisis, the economic crisis in the, in the West or in the developed countries now are I I affecting our, um, our, our commodity markets. Uh, the, the prices are declining, are beginning to fall. We are, getting, we are getting difficulties selling some of our commodities. We are beginning to see fall in, the, in tourist arrivals. Uh, we are going to see investments also being, being, being affected. At the end of the day, this, this may have an impact on, on, on the whole financial stability. They will have an impact on growth of the, of the economy. They will have an impact of our foreign exchange earnings. So they look at these issues and, they, and then they, they recommend. What do we do? Probably recently they were saying probably we should, not, we should now look for other, for other, we should become more proactive in looking for other sources of investment. Tanzania still has a long way to go before it becomes a world-class investment destination. But there is no doubt that it's well on its way, and renowned developmental economist Jeffrey Sachs seems to agree. Tanzania is without question you know, one of the very brightest uh, promises of Africa. I've always believed Tanzania is right at the top of the list with a couple of other countries uh, as uh, pl the places that will break out of poverty first. Uh, I base that on the fact that this is a country in peace, a country that uh, is linguistically united, a country well positioned on the Indian Ocean with several major ports, a country with a quite uh, wide and, and deep base of uh, primary commodities. They've got mineral resources, energy resources, great agricultural resources, a country of friendly people and phenomenal world quality tourism. Uh, whether it's uh, the incomparable safaris or uh, the beachfronts uh, along uh, hundreds of kilometers of Indian Ocean coastline. So this is a country that has uh, the makings of a great success. I admire President Kikweti. I think he's done a, a very fine job. Uh, and uh, I think that he stands in a tradition of uh, democratic uh, governments here that are development oriented. So I put Tanzania quite high on the list of likely to succeed. And maybe what the country needs now is a little creative thinking. And that's exactly what Ulrich Charteris thought when he started up his advertising company, Roots Marketing Communications. Well, originally I, I was creative director for an advertising agency in South Africa. I was sent up here to um, relaunch Vodacom and came up here oh, about four or five years ago for three weeks. I uh, met Sarah, who's now my wife, fell in love with her, fell in love with the country and uh, got a bit tired of South Africa and thought it was a great opportunity here. So I started up Roots two and a half years ago. In South Africa or other parts of the world, and I'm just comparing it to, to first world, and I'm not saying South Africa's first world, to, to here, is that there's a, there's a very definite segmentation between sectors. Um, banking, cars, cigarettes, alcohol, people budget accordingly for their lifestyles. Here, um, in the dollar a day mentality, disposable, we're all fighting for disposable income. Uh, South African breweries is fighting with uh, Tanzanian Cigarette Corporation, who's fighting with cell phone providers for that share of a corporation.